Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 173 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by the infamous Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. Right, let's get straight down to the review part of the show. We're going to start at the Main Street Armory in Rochester, uh, New York, USA. One fight to mention, actually, over here. A real strange one. Dominic Wade, a man that you probably won't even remember. He took on Triple G. I believe it was in April 2016. So he hasn't boxed since then. It's his first fight back. So almost three years out the ring. He got in there with a guy called Martin Fidel Rios. Not a great fighter. 23 and 19 now with four draws. Um, He went into the bout, obviously... Um, with one loss less, because he got knocked out in the first round by Dominic Wade, and to get him out in the first round was quite impressive, I mean, you know, he got knocked out by a few other guys, but it's usually like after the sixth round, or or even later than that, so um, he's also a man that went the distance with Jamie Cox in that crazy fight, I think it was, where they all um, had points deducted, there were head clashes and all sorts of things there, so uh, quite a statement there, really, for, for Dominic Wade, he returned at 173 pounds, that could be a bit of a problem. Will he get back down to 160? I'm not quite sure. Um, moving out now to the Korakuen Hall in Tokyo, Japan. One fight to mention. Former um, former IBF world champion Kenichi Ogawa. It depends if you want to call him a world champion or not, really, because it got took away straight away when he found his drugs test. 22 wins, one loss. He's now 23-1. and one. A unanimous decision over 10 rounds against Roldan Aldea, who's now 12 wins, 7 losses, and 1 draw. Like I say, unanimous um, win there over 10 rounds for Ogawa. Moving out now, though, to the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. A couple of fights to mention here. This was a bill that I was at in person on Saturday night. We saw Scott Fitzgerald move to 12. And O, a knockout in the second round against journeyman Radoslav Mitev, who's now uh, 12 and 46 with two draws. Mitev was down once in the first and then, um, you know, down and out in the second. Um, yeah, that was what it was. We saw Lawrence Okoli. I think it was the third opponent they wanted. I think two opponents pulled out. Um, he eventually got in there with Tamas Lodi, who now has a record of 20 wins, 12 losses, and two draws. And Okoli now 11 and 0. It was the defense of his WBA Continental Cruiserweight title. Loddy was actually down twice in the second round and twice in that third round. Lawrence Okoli had his girlfriend um, sat ringside in the front row and he actually came out to her song. Really seems quite bizarre. I mean, she's a a rapper and um, he came out to her song rather than Okoli's Out the Cage, which was um, pleasant and also a bit unpleasant because I quite like, I'm quite guilty of liking Okoli's Out the Cage. I quite like that tune and and um, he came out to this female rap song, which she did, which I suppose is probably the first time in boxing that's ever happened. Um, that is amazing. Um, so, yeah, that happened. Also, we saw Jake Ball take on Craig Richards. We will be speaking to Craig Richards later on in the show. We said it last week. We're going to speak to the winner, and we've we've delivered that for you. It was for the vacant WBA Continental Light Heavyweight title. Jake Ball was down once in the first round, once in the second round, and once in the third round. He did get back up all three times, to be fair to him but he was stopped um in that third round like i say craig richards just put it on him and the referee jumped in so he forced a stoppage there richards his record now 14 and 1 and jake ball 12 and 2 it's a bad loss for him to come back from to be completely honest there's not too much really to criticize from craig richards i mean i think he looked a little bit stiff in the first round i mean jake actually looked loose whereas sometimes i think he's looked quite stiff in the past um craig did look really really focused in that first round most of it was pretty much a bit 
bit of a jab fest. No one was really letting the hard shots and the backhands go. And then, like I say, a straight right. It was a little sharp one, straight down the pipe, a counter punch, and down went ball. Um, it wasn't a massive shot, but a round where I felt Craig did enough to win anyway, but certainly a 10-8 round with the knockdown. In the second round, again, it was a cagey start to the round, really, until the last sort of minute or so, in which Craig once again was able to drop Jake, and this time it was with a right hook to Jake Ball's body. Right after Ball got wobbled with a shot as well, it was kind of worrying at that stage, really, for Ball, um, and such an incredible and shocking performance at that point from Richards. And then in that third round, um, you know, nothing was working for Jake Ball. He looked too afraid to commit. Um, Richards dropped him again, and this time it was a straight right hand, and, you know, Jake Ball just didn't seem to know how to get out of the way of Richards straight right. And like I say, he was down again. He did get back up. Credit to him. He was brave, but... You know, the referee did let him carry on. He moved around the ring and was dancing around. He got on his bike. He tried to, you know, keep away from the shots and try and regroup. But Craig cleverly cut off the ring and was able to force a stoppage. So a massive win there. And like I say, Jake Ball's in an awful place now. I really can't see him um, getting himself on any matchroom shows again. I think they might even drop him. I know that sounds really, really harsh, but that's the way it is sometimes. You know, especially matchroom, they don't really like to commit too much. They like to give all these guys these one-fight deals and stuff like that like that um it's going to be a real hard place to come back from now this for jake ball but fantastic stuff for craig spider richards like i say we'll be speaking to him later on in the show also on the bill, we got to see Felix Cash move to 11-0, and he also picked up the vacant commonwealth middleweight title his opponent rashid Abolaji, 11 and 5 now with one draw. He came in with, with a few flags with him, if I'm not mistaken. He had a, a nicely, well, fantastically, beautifully dressed corner. I mean, they were they were dressed in all sorts of beautiful colours, and the ring walk was better than his performance, because like I say, he was stopped in the first round, so fantastic there for Felix Cash. A big belt for him to pick up there. And moving up the card now for the final time, the main event here, we saw Sergio Garcia 28 and 0, put his EB European super welterweight title on the line against our very own Ted Cheeseman 15 and 0 somebody's O had to go it ended up being a 12 round unanimous decision for Sergio Garcia straight away in the first round we saw a big round from Sergio Garcia it was an unbelievable pace that he set he went to the body of Cheeseman and the head you know the good work really did come from Garcia his judge of distance was really really impressive I mean he'd move back and avoid Cheeseman's shots he was very very good um, it was a it was a real good display from him it was a clear round to score a big round there for Garcia in the second round it was another clear round for Garcia I mean Cheeseman was walking through the shots but clearly they were taking an effect and it was worrying at that point to see what was going to happen I mean what was going to change from Ted Cheeseman um, you know he just tried to completely walk through the shots of Garcia um, the style matchup straight away from that second round looked awful for Cheeseman it really did I mean everyone on the commentary team by the way I think it was Charlie Edwards it was Dave Caldwell it was Johnny Nelson and perhaps one other it might have been Matthew Macklin could be wrong um, they all said Cheeseman within like five to seven rounds I think Eddie Hearn said a bit later on but yeah it was shocking I mean it was a big upset in those people's eyes um in the third round once again another garcia round he literally wasn't allowed to get into a rhythm ted um there was no head movement from him he was just plodding forward taking shots um he looked like he had a bit of blood under his nose in that third round but yeah garcia wasn't slowing down at all he was still setting such a high pace and it was interesting at that point to see what he'd be like for the next few rounds i didn't think he'd be able to keep up that much of a pace in the fourth round once again another garcia round it was really more of the same from garcia um ted Ted's left hook would work for him here and there, but he had to take about four shots to land it, so it wasn't the best plan. Um, Round five, another clear Garcia round. Round six, Cheeseman would desperately throw a right-hand lead. He'd fall short and just get counted over the top. I mean, nothing was working. He was being totally outclassed after six rounds. In the seventh round, it was more of the same. Um, in the eighth round, Ted Cheeseman. I mean, I've just, I've just got to say, he is a machine. I mean, I'm not sure how he had it left in him, but he actually upped the gears somehow in that eighth round, and he seemed to put it on Garcia. And Garcia did look wobbly here and there, but he's so fleet-footed that it was hard to see if he was actually hurt or not. But he took what Cheeseman had, and he dished out his own too. And it was the first round I actually gave to Ted, even though it was a little bit sympathetic. So I had it 7-1 after eight in favour of the champion, the Spaniard, Garcia. And then in that ninth round, once again, another round for Garcia. Ted just kept his hands down. I mean, he was trying to avoid shots with his lateral movement, but he just kept taking jabs again and again. 
again and again. And Garcia had a real good jab as well, a real impressive jab. And in the 10th round, Garcia would just keep jabbing and move into his left and to Ted's right, obviously. And Ted would simply just follow him. He just was not cutting off the ring. Um, he wouldn't throw a right hand to Garcia's body. He just kept head hunting. And Garcia, with his great head movement and his foot movement, he was able to keep away and he made it look quite you know, quite easy. I don't want to be cliche here, but it was a little bit like a Spanish matador and, and an English bulldog, if you like. I'm going to throw a double whammy in there. But, um, you know, Garcia, to his credit, he did keep his left hand low and maybe a right hand body shot from Ted Cheeseman wouldn't have always landed if he did try that, even though I wanted to see more body work from um, from Ted Cheeseman because, you know, that, that I think would, would have probably been better than just constantly headhunting. But Garcia would keep his elbow tucked in and he would throw the jab from the hip. You know, it was a hard, it was, it was real hard to read. In that 11th round, Ted had a moment where he hit Garcia and Garcia did look stunned, but he seemed to momentarily signal to his corner mid-punch that he was all right. It was so weird. But um, yeah, anyways, Garcia, you know, if he was hurt, he did end up getting his legs back under him and he was able to box and win that round clearly once again. So 10-1 to Garcia. A, um, a bit of a boxing lesson at this point for Ted Cheeseman. I think the towel really could have came in, to be honest. Um, it was interesting to see what the scorecards were going to be, because some people sat near me, had it quite close, and I couldn't believe that. Like, we were almost arguing ringside. And then in the 12th and final round, it was a tough round, really. It could have gone either way. I mean, honestly, I gave it to Ted, I think, on sympathy, but 10-2 then, that means I had it finally, after everything, to Sergio Garcia. I did say it on last week's podcast that I hoped um, Cheeseman wouldn't get any favours done on the scorecards and I mean one of them they really tried to do him a favour I think one of the scorecards had it by one or two rounds was it I can't remember it was really close which is just terrible I mean people have bashed that scorecard on Twitter already but um, I won't add to that but there was some some accurate scorecards I think someone had it 11-1 one of the judges so that's about right and I had it 10-2 so a, a big upset there for Cheeseman but like I say listen he tried to step up he's still a young kid he's still got a bright future he's still a tough guy he's still a British level fighter he can still beat a lot of guys and to be honest even with his style he could have overwhelmed and he would have overwhelmed a lot of fighters that night he's a fit fit tough guy with a solid chin and he will wear people down and end up stopping them late on that's just the kind of style he's got he's he's that kind of guy but i think he needs to go back to his boxing because he didn't try to box this guy here on saturday night um even if he did try and box he may have come up short anyway because the guy was a real good boxer and i think they must have overlooked him um but yeah it, it kind of you know deflates the potential Anthony Fowler fight down the line should Fowler beat Fitzgerald which again is not a given we can see that anything can happen in boxing but yeah for me I think Ted Cheeseman probably fights the loser of that fight um, but yeah he's still got a British title so the big fights can still get made I guess so perhaps maybe he doesn't get the loser maybe he gets the winner but his stocks drop just slightly but I'm sure his experience um, goes on to another level hopefully so all the very best to Ted big fans of him on this podcast Moving out now, though, to the final bill to mention at the Ford Center at the Star in Frisco, Texas, USA. Um, one or two fights to mention over here. Uh, well, four fights in total. We saw Tiafimo Lopez, 11-0, move to 12-0. A KO in the seventh round of a scheduled 10 against Diego Magdaleno, who's now 31-3. and It was for the vacant NABA USA lightweight title, the NABF lightweight title, and the USBA lightweight title. Um, yeah, Tiafimo Lopez, I mean, he just punches too hard. And he had... Um, Magdaleno in trouble at many points during the fight. Um, they're talking about this Lomachenko fight already. I think we need to remember that Lopez is still 21 years of age. Even though um, what's Lomachenko had now? I think he's had about 14 fights, something like that. And this guy has now had 12 fights, so they're close in terms of pro experience, but they're not really, because Lomachenko's fought the way better opposition, and Lomachenko's like, I forget how old he is, he's, he's a quite a bit older than this guy, and obviously he had the extensive amateur career, whereas Tiafimo Lopez, I think he was a good amateur, but he didn't really win anything major, you know, so um, I think he got he got beaten straight away in the Olympics in like the first round, could be mistaken, I'm not massive on my amateur boxing, so please don't jump down my throat, but you know, I think that's 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 absolutely silly to put him in with Lomachenko this early because he would lose in bad fashion and I think it would be quite demoralizing I think it's it's a way to really wreck a prospect 
to throw him in there with Lomachenko. He's 21 years of age. He's still a kid. It's not the right time for him, even though he's really impressing. And like I say, he's got a great fighting style. He's a great talker. He's got a real bright future, and he's a real gem. He really is. I mean, Bob Arum's got a fantastic prospect on his hands there, but Lomachenko right now? No, not for me. I don't think so. In that second round, I forgot to mention, he literally uppercutted the snot out of Magdaleno's nose. Um, You know, it was an unbelievable performance. It was a massive step up for him when we look back. And, you know, Magdaleno had only lost to world champions. Um, Lopez, like I say, he is still a prospect. He's got the athleticism. He's got the power. He's got the reflexes. He's got fantastic punch picking. That's probably his best asset. He's got great speed and he's got swagger about him. And like I say, he can go a long way. Very, very fan-friendly style. He's got the good looks too. And another brutal knockout for him. Um, One left hook followed by another left hook and yet another KO of the year contender for him and we're only a few weeks into 2019 I mean he got a fantastic knockout at the back end of 2018 Um, you know the way he threw the first shot the first left hook was reminiscent of Prince Nassim the way he jumped in with the left hook it was quite reminiscent of what the Prince used to do oh boy oh boy if you're getting compared to the Prince you must be doing something right also on the bill we saw Oscar Valdez move to 25 and 0 he took on Carmine Tomasson who was 19 and 0 somebody's O had to go of course it wasn't Valdez as his O. Um, Thomason was down in the fourth round and in the sixth round and in the seventh round where um, he was TKO'd in that seventh round. Um, it was for Valdez's WBO World Featherweight title, his first fight since the war against our very own Scott Quigg. It was a bit of a slow start, really, from Valdez. Um, in that fourth round, obviously, Thomason threw a combination himself, but while doing that, he left himself wide open, and Valdez landed a right hand, and down went Thomason. Like I say, that was the first knockdown. It wasn't a heavy shot. Thomason once again was down when he took a knee after taking a left hook to the body. I think that was I think there was two knockdowns, actually, in that fourth round, if I'm not mistaken. Um, round six, Thomason again went down. I think it was a body shot, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And then in the seventh round... Uh, that was, like I say, the, the last round. Thomason was down with the very first punch of the round that Valdez landed. It was a right uppercut, and that was all what she wrote. So a decent win. It took it took Valdez a little bit longer than I expected going in, but a good win for him. Uh, we saw also on the bill Richard Comey, 28-2 and two now. He's the new IBF World Lightweight Champion. It's finally happened for him after a couple of dodgy decisions going against him. Uh, he took on Issa Shanaev, 13-1 and one now, 13-2, and two, the Russian Um, Shanaev was down in the first round and twice in the second and final round that's a brilliant brilliant thing there for um, for Mr. Comey Um, a good fighter I mean it was a good first round really both men were going at it from the first bell it was a real exciting start to a world title fight and Comey had to take a few big shots himself but in that last 20 or so seconds that's when he did drop Shanaev and the power that Comey has is very real and you know he hits very very hard for a lightweight Shaniev did get back up from that knockdown, but he did look wobbly, and he did manage to get through the remaining seconds. And like I say, he came out in the second round, and he got dropped within the first nine seconds, I believe it was. He did get back up on very unsteady legs, and Comey was able to pin him down, really, and drop him for the third and final time before the referee stepped in and concluded the action. So, fantastic stuff for Comey. Um, He's, I believe, Ghana's ninth or tenth ever world champion, so that's history-making for him. And the top of the bill here, Alida Alvarez, 24-0, defending his WBO World Light Heavyweight title against Sergei Kovalev, former holder of the belt, 32-3 with one draw. It ended up being a unanimous decision over 12 rounds in favor of Kovalev. I backed Kovalev to win by knockout, but I said just a couple days before the fight, I said, I've got a weird feeling an unpopular opinion that Kovalev's going to win on points. I wish I'd have put my money where my mouth was, or at least picked it on the Prediction League. Um, But yeah, it was what it was. It ended up being, like I say, a 12-round unanimous decision in favor of Mr. Kovalev. He regains his world title. The actual fight itself, though, in the first round, for me, it was... It was a nothing round, really. I mean, Kovalev won it for me just slightly. Um, Whenever Alvarez did throw, Kovalev would kind of backpedal to get well away from the shot. He clearly respected Alvarez's power. And Kovalev was the one pressing the action um, and and coming forward in that first round. That's what I will say. And that was encouraging for him. In the second round, it was a much clearer round in that second. Kovalev once again won that round. He was very methodical in there. He was thinking in there. He got off with some nice right hands. And Alvarez, aside from one or two nice jabs, he didn't have much success in that round. In the third round, another 
another Kovalev round for me. Um, Alvarez did try and bring it to Kovalev a little bit, but he still didn't do enough to win the round. The fourth and fifth rounds were pretty similar. I think Kovalev won pretty... I won't say pretty clearly, but he won the rounds fair and square. Um, in the sixth round, Alvarez started well and seemed to stun Kovalev momentarily, but Kovalev definitely dominated the rest of the round with his activity, and Alvarez seemed to not really be doing enough. I mean, I'm guessing he was banking on Kovalev tiring, which happened in the first fight, but Kovalev obviously couldn't afford to do that here, and for me, he was in total control, six rounds to zero after six. Going into the second half of the fight, uh, the seventh round for me was probably the closest round of the fight at that point. I still gave it to Kovalev, though. Um, he did seem like he was tiring, to be honest. I was wondering, could the tide be turning? In the eighth round, again, another Kovalev round. In the ninth round, another round for Kovalev. Um, very confusing tactics from Alvarez. He looked to to, to be the much fresher of the two in those later rounds, but he just didn't seem to go for it. There was no urgency in his work, and the rounds were just flying by. They really were. Um, the 10th round, a big round for Kovalev, excellent boxing display from him. He was even able to, to really knock back the head of Alvarez with some lovely left hands, and he certainly had Alvarez in trouble in that 10th. In the 11th round, I felt that that round was actually a close round, but I sympathetically gave it to Alvarez, even though... He fought in bursts. He did have bits and bits of success. And after he would have success, Kovalev, to his credit, would actually go on the attack and pretty much scribble over Alvarez's good work. Um, he kind of, you know, came back with his own success, Kovalev. But I sympathetically gave that round to Mr. Alvarez. And then in the 12th and final round, I gave it to Kovalev. I mean, he seemed to hurt Alvarez numerous times in that round. Um, I don't think Alvarez left it all in the ring. Uh, that's obviously his problem, and that's very unfortunate for him. But Kovalev went out like a true champion in that final round, and he won it. And, you know, if there was going to be any closeness on the cards, that was, you know, the... That was a fantastic way, really, to end a good, good fight and a great performance. Now, one thing I will say is I had it 11-1. Um, the commentators that I heard on the on the Box Nation feed were, were you know, I think they had it... Well, they had it to Kovalev in the end, but they had it a lot closer than me. And they actually made me think um, that, that I was in the wrong. But when it went back to the studio and we saw Steve Bunce and Barry Jones and Steve Lillis, they had it pretty much like I had it. They said it was like a shutout or 11 to 1 or 10 to 2, whatever. So my scorecard um, was, was, was pretty much in agreement with the likes of those guys. So that, that's, um, that's good for me. That made me feel like I was on the ball. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just looking back at a few other little facts and, and stuff like that, Kovalev obviously blamed overtraining for the first defeat. He said he didn't feel good that day. And he said he had no energy. And he knew that if he didn't stop Alvarez in the first fight within four rounds, that he wouldn't be able to go the distance. And to be honest, I'm going to accept that. The amount of people that were so sure of Alvarez getting the knockout was really surprising for me. I mean, he only only one probably one or two rounds in that first fight and that was when he got the knockout and this time he won one round he actually won one round or two rounds at best i mean come on um you know they they fought for 19 rounds now all in all and kovalev's probably won about 16 or 17 of them i mean he did look very tired at the end of this fight here and he really had to work for the win but it was well deserved you know he's back to the top he's arguably the best light heavyweight in the world again there's the likes of Dmitry Bivol the likes of Arta Baturbiev and Alexander Gvozdik I'd like to see any of those fights or all of those fights and he called for all those names in the ring afterwards so for me you know we've got to remember Andre Ward's gone and Adonis Stevenson, unfortunately, has, has, has left boxing as well. So it leaves Kovalev. They were his only competitors before. He's proved more than all the other champions. He's got the best wins um, than all these other champions. So for me, he's right back at the top, even though it wasn't you know, a, a clear-cut, excellent display where he schooled the guy. He didn't. You know, He looked to be in, in trouble with his stamina towards the later rounds. There were a few rocky moments here and there. He took a few big shots here and there. Um, but yeah, him against Bivol, I'd love to see that fight. Him against um, Baturbiev, I'd love to see that fight. Real, real good fights, and certainly all Russian affairs there. Um, throw Anthony Yard in the mix should he get through his next fight. He's saying that Kovalev's only a temporary uh, champion, so that, that is interesting in words there um so yeah some great fights down the line and i'm excited and happy to see um to see sergey kovalev regain his status as a proper legit world champion but that's about it for the review part of the show just before we wrap up part one the last thing to do of course is to welcome our very first guest 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the new WBA Continental Light Heavyweight Champion. It is, of course, Mr. Craig Richards. Craig, welcome back on the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you back, man. Glad to be back. (laughs) It's good to have you back. (laughs) So, Craig, we we said on last week's show, actually, that there was probably no real point in getting you or Jake on the podcast before the rescheduled fight, because we had you both on uh, before the original fight date. I think we last spoke back in... Uh, back in September, but we also said on last week's podcast that we'll just speak to the winner of the fight um, the the following week, so here we are, Um, you won the fight, how are you feeling at the moment Craig, a new belt to add to the mantelpiece obviously? Hey, I feel good you know, I feel good, Uh, the fight was built up very high, the anticipation of the fight was high, a lot of pressure on the careers and um, everything was on the line, so I came through and I came through convincingly, so I felt great. And there was, of course, supposed to be this this coin toss about who would walk first and all that business. Jake kept leaving quickly after all the media obligations and missing an opportunity to toss a coin. In the end, you you obviously walked first. Um, did a coin toss ever take place in the end? Yeah, it had took place in the morning of the fight. Okay. Um, so uh, we won the coin toss, but I let him walk second. What's the reason behind that? That's kind of strange, right? <laughs> because I don't care about all of that stuff. So we said we'll take home corner and you can walk second. Okay. Um, to us, it doesn't matter. We're going to get in the ring and we're going to fight the same way. Uh, I've done it before. My third fight walking first. Um, it doesn't make a difference to me. And the fight itself, have you had a chance to watch it back yet? I'm sure you have. Yeah, I have only for the first time last night. I watched it back and, um, yeah, it was a good performance. I've watched it twice. Um uh, you know, along with obviously seeing it live. Now, I was sat there ringside, and my only real criticism of you, if I'm being harsh, if I'm being really harsh, yeah. I thought you looked quite stiff in the first round. And don't get me wrong, it could have just been how focused you were, but you did seem quite stiff, and he looked very loose, perhaps looser than than, than usual. Um, would you agree, or am I being too harsh? <laughs> No, nah, I think you're the first person in the world who said that. Everyone said it was the other way around. Nah, Everyone nah. else said I looked really relaxed. Even the commentary said that I was relaxed and he was a bit tense. Mm, okay. All right. Um, the first knockdown obviously came in, in, in the first round. A nice, quick, short right hand counter straight down the pipe. Was that encouraging you for you, Craig? I know that you obviously expected to eventually knock him out, but to put him down in that first round surely must have been a little bit of a surprise for put- yourself. I thought I was going to put him down the first three with that same shot. I said it to Peter the night before. Um, I watched him. I watched a couple of his old fights, and I said, I saw that was one of his major errors, and I said, I'm going to catch him with a straight right, and I'm going to hurt him for the first three. I said, I'll probably put him down. I weren't sure of how much impact it would have if he would get up or how hurt he'd be, but I did realise, because I saw he, gets, he, he was quite vulnerable to that shot. And, um, yeah, so I said, I'm going to land it, and we'll see how he responds to it. And then, of course, the second knockdown uh, was in that second round. It was a body shot. It didn't really look like you connected fully. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was still a good shot, obviously, but it didn't seem like a real rib-busting bang. Were you surprised he took a knee from that shot there? Not at all, because sort of, you, you're not seeing it too primary and too black and white. It wasn't a rib shot. I cut across his solar plex. I chopped the shot across the belly, so it winded him. I cut, I cut all the wind out of his stomach. I was surprised he got up, to be honest. And then, of course, the, the final knockdown came in that third and final round. And that third knockdown of the fight, uh, once again, was a straight right hand that put him down. He did get back up for the third time <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and immediately got on his bike. And obviously, it took you about 30 or so seconds to eventually cut the ring off and just unload Tracking on him. Tracking now. Yeah, you did. And I uh, knew at some point he was going to run, and I worked on that in camp. I said that time and time again. I know he can do both. He can come forward and fight, so I prepared for that, how he ended up getting knocked down. And I prepared for him to run, because I saw his last fight against Marshall Quinn. He was on his bike. So I knew we worked on tracking the ring down. So when he got on his bike and thought he had flee, I knew he weren't going anywhere. <laughs> Surely that marks the best win of your career, though, Craig. 100%. Definitely, 100%. Uh, especially that everyone doubted me secretly. Um, everyone said... He's going to be too big for you, too strong. He's a pedigree, he's GB pedigree and all of this and that. It's going to be too much. You won't be able to outbox him. He's jabs too much. His combinations, his hand speed's too fast. I heard it all, heard it all, heard it all. And I went out, I outboxed him, beat him to the punch. Too strong for him. 
and I bullied him. I done everything everyone says that he was going to do to me. He said to me, don't run. And we saw what happened. We certainly did. And and like I say, obviously you mentioned there you were the underdog going into the fight. Um, looking back, Craig, was that fair? Can you understand why he'd you know he'd be a favourite? Obviously, being a big light heavy, being a six foot four southpaw puncher, you've obviously had to move up in weight. Um, I would argue, I would argue, don't 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 shout at me here, but I'd argue he probably had a couple of more standout wins than you did, perhaps. Um, you know, not to mention he had the worst loss of the two. That that's obviously clear. But mm-hmm. can you understand why he'd have been a favourite? Was that fair? I wouldn't say he was the favourite for his standout wins, but I would say he's more the favourite for loads of other reasons. Um, I can completely understand him being the favourite, 110%. He, um, he's the bigger guy. He's got a bigger amateur pedigree. He's got the uh, bigger... Um, yeah, he had the bigger pedigree. He's the bigger guy. He's got a bigger knockout ratio. He's ranked above me, and he was the champion. So why wouldn't he not be the favourite? Agreed 100%. Now, one thing that shocked me when I watched it back on TV, I didn't notice it so much when I was watching it, um, you know, from a couple rows back. And like I say, I've watched it twice um, back to back um, at home. Is you looked much taller than he did. Now, I know that obviously he's got a bit of a crouch to him. He likes to stay kind of compact. He doesn't really stand tall for his height. But you're the total opposite. I mean, you stand tall. And honestly, watching it back, if he's six foot four, you looked about six foot eight. Are you sure you're six one, Craig? Uh. I'm not six one. It's box rec. I just leave them to leave it there. <laughs> I don't know where they got six one from. <laughs> but I like the fact that you think I'm six one. I don't know where, who ever at that. But uh, I was like six one like ten years ago. But I like it because everyone thinks I'm shorter than I am. <laughs> oh gosh, we'll let the real we'll let the real height remain a mystery. I don't know what box. I don't know where box trick gets some of their information from. Well, I think no one, no one seems to know the answer to that. Um, your sister was uh, obviously was obviously there in attendance, Craig. And I just want to say, I mean, she counts for about a hundred fans. I mean, what a supporter! I overheard her talking to someone just a couple minutes before you walked to the ring, and she was real nervous. She was saying how apparently a member of Jake's team had told her like your brother's getting knocked out, and I think it kind of only fired her up because she was screaming advice out. She was screaming abuse to. Jake, the whole fight, it just seemed to, to work so well. She's a real supporter, man. It just gets personal because on social media, they were disrespecting me. Uh, my supporters dis- disrespected him at times. And it was more than just me and Jake fighting. It was a build up. Their families, my family was getting involved. My supporters, their supporters. And it got really personal outside of boxing. Uh, even you heard it kicked off a bit at the way in with them all. And um, it was more than me winning or Jake winning. It was our lot winning or their lot winning. It become a division and teams and people got in the middle of things and there was people of mutuals of us who got into awkward situations because people wanted them to pick a side. And I personally, for everyone who was in the middle, just didn't really want to put anyone in that position. Like, because I thought me and Jake was fighting, it was, I didn't really want everyone else getting involved, but it was a personal situation, so everyone was really passionate about it, and a lot of my people knew what I went through, all the pull-outs and stuff like that, and still making my career and stuff like that, so it's got a bit more than just a boxing fight for everyone. And to kind of put all that to bed, um, you know, one thing about you, Craig, is, is is that you're so humble and everyone saw that in that post-fight interview. Um, you know, you showed pure class in what you said. You asked for people to not really get on Jake's back and that losing a fight doesn't necessarily mean he's a bad fighter. And I just wanted to basically applaud that because that was your moment in the spotlight with emotions running high. You could have said anything. You could have called people out. You could have started telling people that your right hand can send people to the moon. But you took that moment <laughs> to, to say, those kind words and I felt that that was class from you there um, Craig to kind of put that rivalry to bed on a good note yeah because at the end of the day like I could have kicked the man while he's down I said I was going to do all this I, he said he was going to do all that and I'd done what I said I was going to do I could sit at the moment and say see I told you I'm this I'm that but it's not about that it's about at the end of the day he's gone through what I've gone through he's gone through training camp um, for a fight with me he put himself under pressure he put his career on the line and at the end of the day he's come up short and I feel you probably feel shit enough so I don't know why you would want to kick him even more now and I feel like the fact that he took the fight and he's fought a 50-50 fight well 60-40 fight to him but 50-50-ish um, 
I think that there's credit because there's a lot of prospects who ain't doing that and he's done it and I don't think he should get punished for it. And at the end of the day, if a man's living, I don't think everyone should be like, right, that's it, you should retire now. Because what's he going to do? Go sign up with McDonald's and work there? No, he's not. He needs to make a living. He needs to make money. Don't be so harsh and put him back in the mix, make him fight someone else and the show goes on. Yeah, very well said, man. Very well said. And lastly, the last real question. I mean, on Box Rex rankings, I know that we we said they're not always so accurate, and their rankings <laughs> sometimes are crazy. But um, you're ranked now as the fifth best light heavyweight in Britain. Now, I know that you'd probably say yeah. you believe you're the best in Britain, but you know how the rankings work. You you, you know you get ranked. Everything works. You got to prove yourself. Yeah, don't exactly. You? Exactly. You you get ranked by what you've done, by who you've beaten. Do you believe that your rankings fair based on what you've done and what the four guys above you have done? Those four guys, by the way, one to four is Anthony Yard, Josh Buatzi, um Callum Johnson third. I can't really understand that one. And Liam Liam Conroy, yeah, who's exactly. fighting Buatzi's fourth. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't say the rankings are accurate. You know, I know, we don't believe them rankings reflect on based on anything is right. But um, near enough about, I believe I'm roughly around top five. Um, not Obviously, I believe I'm the best, but in terms of proven achievements, I believe I'm somewhere around the mix of the top five now, and I think that's fair to say I'm around there. So I think um, the rankings ain't far off than myself. Yeah. In position, yeah. I mean, like I say, you're you're fifth there. I'd, I'd say I'd even go a bit further. I'd probably say top three, and that's that's me being brutally honest. Yeah, I think I should be top three. Yeah, um, I'll I'll be top four by next month. So, um, I'm I'm getting to where I should really. I think top three, I should definitely justify to be there. But obviously, after Black and Conroy fight, one goes down, one goes up, which puts me in the top four because one of them is obviously going to have to go behind me. Mm-hmm. But I think I should be top three by now. But it's all a matter of time. Um, as I done the interview the other day, someone said, "How do you feel that?" I think was it you or no? Someone else said to me, "How do I feel about not being mentioned as one of the best light heavyweights when they mentioned Callum Johnson, Joshua Whitesick, etc., cetera, etc.?" Cetera. And I just said, "Like, I don't. It's about like proving yourself, and in boxing, everything unravels. Um, so your position will always be where it's meant to be eventually." Because boxing, you're going to have to fight everyone eventually, so you'll, 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 everything will be unraveled and the truth always comes out in the end. So I don't worry for now. I feel like I'll just keep working hard to keep proving myself and eventually I'll get the spot. And I said that before the fight with Jake. And now, now as I said that, what we, on, based on that conversation about me being mentioned as one of the best light heavyweights, now I'm mentioned as one of the best light heavyweights. So that's why I said it wasn't bothered me before the Jake fight because I said that will come to fruition and it has and as again I'll say I'm moving forward again it will happen again I will just keep proving myself they say if it doesn't happen don't complain that just means you didn't work hard enough last year <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great mentality to have and this has been real enjoyable speaking about all of this uh, Craig just to just to just to basically sign off have you got any closing words just for the listeners any any closing words at all to anybody in particular just thank you everyone for supporting me Everyone who comes out to the show, buys tickets, Dean Richards, these sits and supports me, and I just thank all of them. My family, I thank my sponsors as well, who get behind me, because obviously, without all these people and networking and people supporting you, it can't happen. I thank everyone, Peter Sims, Darnell Smith, even the help from Tony Sims and everyone. I'm, I'm just I'm grateful for it. And all you media guys who give me a good outlook on things, and, you know, some people do snide things, um, behind you and stuff, but all the media people give everyone a fair shake and they're not um, trying to kick you and tarnish your image. I've just got to thank those people who do their job properly. I just heard there. It sounded like the 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 alarm in the in the uh, in the uh, in the gym when it signals the end of three minutes. But it's not that. It sounds like you you burnt something in the kitchen. What are you trying to cook? No, <laughs> no, no, no. It was a gym. It was a gym alarm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Craig. Listen, my man. It's, it's it's fantastic having you on the podcast once again. I'd like to thank you for your time. Congrats once again on Thanks the win. And on we'll this. catch we'll catch up with you again very soon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Ayaz, take it away with the news. 
Yes, uh, so Shantan Cameron has left Cyclone's promotion. Yeah, very sad situation. I mean, she posted about it on um, on Instagram, and to be honest, very uh, it was very brave of her. You know, she came out and spoke about how she's being, in her opinion, um, mistreated and all the rest of it. She talked about a very poor training situation in which she doesn't even train there um, for for the for the most part of the week. She trains elsewhere and then comes down to the McGuigan gym. I think it's just two days a week, which obviously isn't enough. Uh, she feels like she's being neglected, and I think she even. Used Use the word humiliated, which is a big, big word, you know. So um, it's sad, you know. We've heard a story before, obviously involving Carl Frampton, and it's sad, you know. That's that's the, probably the word I'm looking for. So um, yeah, brave stuff from Chantel to come out and you know and say something like that. But the main thing is, it's good to shake off these negative people if they are indeed negative people and they're you know they're just a bad influence on her career. Then it's good to get those kind of people out the way early on, you know, while you're still undefeated while you've still got a fantastically bright future which she does have and she's a good fighter you know she's a she's a she's a good fighter she really is I like the way she is she's you know pretty different to the rest of the girls there's something about her and um, you know I've got a lot of respect for her for coming out and saying that and I wish her nothing but the best I think she's done a couple of sessions in Jamie Moore's gym if I'm if I'm uh, not mistaken, so that could be interesting. Um, another top trainer. So um, all the best to Chantel Cameron, and you know, applaud it certainly for coming out and 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 you know addressing this as it is. Um, you know, you can't have anything but respect for her for coming out and saying this. Charlie Edwards would defend his WBC title against Angel Marino uh, on March the twenty third. Yes, um, Charlie obviously did a little bit of pundit work on Saturday um, and I saw him at the O2 Arena and we spoke about it. And uh, yeah, he's well up for this fight. It's a, it's a guy that he sparred in the build-up to the John Real Casemiro fight. Um, so yeah, I think they know each other quite well. Um, for me, it's probably going to be a pretty comfortable win for Charlie I'm guessing if he's sparred him before then he knows you know he knows what he's about and I think since then Charlie's come on leaps and bounds really he's seriously grown up since that fight um, not just you know not just physically but mentally and all the rest of it and he's a much better fighter today than he was back then he'll be the first to admit that so for me it's a nice easy touch and he deserves it he really does he's got the best belt in world boxing and he's Britain's um, Britain's own WBC world champion and he beat arguably the best fighter in that division so yeah he deserves a nice little touch here and um, obviously we'll want to see that Yafai fight down the line whether or not that happens is a different story but brilliant for him to be topping a bill at the copper box on the date that you said so and um, it's a fantastic undercard it's shaping up to be I as we're seeing yeah. um, um, Lawrence Okoli versus Wadi Camacho that's going to be a brilliant yeah. fight that's for the British and Commonwealth cruiserweight titles obviously the British with Okoli and the Commonwealth with, with Camacho and um, there's another fight on the bill. Yep. Which is Joshua Boatti versus Liam Conroy for the vacant uh, Lonsdale light heavyweight title. Brilliant. So, like I say, another great fight, a big step up there for Boatti. Um, you know, people are getting a little bit ahead of themselves with the rankings with Boatti and stuff like that, saying he's like perhaps the best in in uh, in the light heavyweight division in the UK. I think it's a little bit too soon to start saying that, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, Conroy's obviously fought the likes of Miles Shinkwin, and a win over him will be a big. You know, a big name for Boatsy's record. Um, and also, we will see Andy Townend take on Lewis Ritson as well on that card. That is for Lewis Ritson's British lightweight title. He still holds that belt. Of course, it wasn't on the line uh, when he fought Patera. <laughs> That's quite obvious. But, um, yeah, great, great card, that one at the Copper Box. And I love a Copper Box show. The only thing is it's so annoying because um, unless you're getting a cab right outside or a bus, you've got to walk for miles. And uh, it's a bit annoying to get to, but I like the venue and um, I'll certainly be there to to support all the guys on that bill so thoroughly looking forward to that one Frank Warren has won the purse bids for Josh Warrington versus Kid Galahad yes we'll be looking out for an announcement probably in the next um, well probably in the next sort of 
week or two perhaps i'm guessing that's just a pure guess but yeah good fight um kid galahad finally gets his chance he's been waiting forever for a chance obviously um he's you know he was kept out the ring for a, for quite a while down to his own doings and his own problems outside of the ring but um yeah a good fighter is kid galahad and it's a great fight it's a real tactical fight it's going to be interesting to see how galahad can deal with um with warrington's relentless style and also how warrington can deal with a pure pure your boxer. I think that Galahad's a much better boxer than Warrington, but it's just a case of can Galahad keep it up and keep um, you know Warrington off of him. I think Warrington has got a good chin on him. I don't think Galahad's got that much snap in his shots. I think he's you know he, he hits hard enough to to make you know about it kind of thing. But interesting clash of styles, and honestly, that's a bit of a pick and fight once again. Even though Galahad hasn't really got a world recognised win, if you like, um, Galahad is is. I don't want to say like one of the best kept secrets in boxing because everyone knows who he is and how good he is, but he hasn't really had that opportunity to prove on the world stage and make a statement. And you know his biggest fights he has he has performed well in, and he's been looking re- you know good recently. He's got some form behind him, so very exciting fight that one. And I'll be I'll be watching that one <laughs> with a, a real interesting set of eyes. Callum Johnson with a Sean or Monihan on in New York. Yeah, that one's set for March 9th. Um, obviously, we saw Callum Johnson last time out take on Baturbiev. He dropped him, but he ended up getting stopped himself. And it was a real brave and valiant effort. And like I say, we really applauded him when the fight took place, when we were talking about it on the podcast after the fight. I said how you know he went out there and fought like a Brit that wanted to win. He went and fought like a, you know, like, like a man challenging for a world title should fight like. He left it all in the ring and he just wasn't good enough on the night, um, it was a big step up for him, but this is a step back, you know, Shawnee Manahan, I remember he was, I think he was 28-0 and 0 before he took his first loss, and he's kind of found his level a little bit, I think he was slightly overrated, so it's a good scout for his record, to be honest, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good fight, it's not really a given, because Monaghan's had the kind of bigger fights, um, even though he's lost them, you know, he took on the likes of Sullivan Barrera and a few other guys, and he's probably got the better win, because still, You've got to say, you've got to admit it, Callum Johnson's best win was Frank Buglioni, who retired, what, about a year after that fight? So he was at the end of his tether, pretty much. Um, So, yeah, he beat Frank Buglioni. It looked fantastic. But Buglioni was a British-level fighter at the time. So, I don't know. It's it's, it's funny, really, to kind of say, well, yeah, he's going to walk through Monaghan. There's there's no real proof of that. So it could be a good fight. But either way, I'm excited for it. And, you know, it's a fight that I welcome 100%. Anthony Yard will now face Travis Reeves. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame we didn't get to see the Mehdi Amar fight just for the simple reason that Amar went the distance with Alexander Gvozdik, who obviously dethroned Stevenson in the fashion that he did. It was going to be good to see Anthony Yard fair with with um, with with Amar because, like I say, Amar went the distance with Gvozdik and could Anthony Yard get him out of there and do something that a now reigning world champion couldn't do? Unfortunately, we're not going to get to find out because Mehdi Amar's pulled out. It's a great, great shame. But in steps Travis Reeves. Um, yeah, you know, an American fighter from Baltimore with a record of 17 and 3 with two draws. He's only got seven knockouts from his 17 um, wins, so he's not a big puncher. A lot of people say stuff like Anthony Yard doesn't want to fight a puncher because perhaps he's hiding a glass chin. You know... I don't know if that's the case. I don't think that is the case. But this is another situation where you think, well, this guy is a non-puncher yet again. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. I'm not feeding into that rumor, but that's what some people say. And a lot of people like to hate on Anthony Yard. He's a friend of this show and a friend of mine. Um, But yeah, I don't really see this guy causing Anthony Yard any problems. He's 38 years of age. Um, You know, he got knocked out in the 12th round by Caro Murat. I remember Caro, Caro Murat losing to... Uh, Nathan Cleverly back in 2010 so uh, he's been around the block but other than that I mean his best win was probably last time out he beat Lanell Bellows a bit of a prospect Um, he had Bellows down twice and ended up winning unanimously over 10 I mean Lanell Bellows again not really a proven fighter I say a prospect as well he's 33 years of age but um, that's probably his standout win to be honest I mean not much else on his record. Um, yeah, it's not that impressive. I'm expecting Anthony Yard to just go in there and walk straight through him. But again, that one is set for um, for uh, for Leicester on 
uh, Saturday the 23rd of February. So for those guys that are going to be switching between James DeGaulle and the Anthony Yard card, um, if you don't want to watch this fight, then you can just keep it on the on the James DeGaulle bill, um, which does have a nice solid undercard. But yeah, it's a shame, but um, the show still goes on. And, you know, credit to the team for putting together, um, you know, another opponent that quickly. So, uh, so Anthony Yard does actually get a fight because last time out when his opponent pulled out a couple days before fight night he was out in uh in in the states on the wilder fury undercard ready to fight and then his opponent got pulled and they couldn't get anyone in time so he just had to watch the boxing that night and not participate in it so uh yeah it is what it is all the very best to anthony yard jordan gill will face emmanuel dominguez on march the second yeah that one gonna be in in peterborough it's an jd next gen card the interesting thing about Jordan Gill's opponent here, Emmanuel Dominguez, 24 and 7 with two draws. Of his seven losses, he's only been stopped once. And he's only 25 years of age, by the way. And he got stopped by Emmanuel Navarrete, the guy that just recently beat and dethroned Isaac Dogbe. So, um, yeah, a decent step up there for Jordan Gill. Um, on the undercard of that, by the way, we're going to get to see Anthony Sims Jr. Um, he's on that bill, along with a few other guys. But, you know, looking forward to see Anthony Sims Jr. fighting on British soil. I think that's the second time he's done that. I think he was on another card before. But, yeah, he's got a, a, a real, you know, a real fan base in, in the UK. I don't know how. I don't know why. <laughs> but all these all these people he keeps retweeting on my timeline, all these UK guys, oh, you need to fight over here. I'm thinking, where did he make these fans from? But, um, you know, it is what it is. All the best to him. Um I think he actually wants to come on the podcast at some point, so we'll perhaps look to that, um, you know, depending on who he ends up fighting. But yeah, that is uh, that is going to be yet another good card, March the 2nd, so yeah, on Sky Sports and DAZN. And that's it for the news. Okay, thank you very much, Ayaz. Right, let's get to the previewing now. This one's happening at the Horden Pavilion in Sydney, um, Australia. This one is a bit of a strange one. It's, it's, it's actually up there for Strange Fight of the Week, which I think we should probably bring in as a new little award thing um, here and there. We used to do the funny name fighter. That kind of fizzled out. We should start doing Strange Fight of the Week, and this one certainly is the strange one. Um, son of former world champion Costa Zoo, Tim Tazoo, 11 and 0. He's in a 12 round contest against Denton Vassell, Britain's very own, 25 and 5. That's a weird one there. Uh, moving out now to Paris in France at the Dome de Paris Palais des Sports. We're going to get to see Solomon Sissoko, former Olympian, the guy that beat Carlos Molina on points. I think it was last year. Um, he's in a 10-rounder. I don't think he's fought since that Molina fight. He's 7-0. and Like I say, he fights for the vacant French super welterweight title against Roman Garofalo, who has a record of 14-3. and uh, Moving out now to Belfast, Northern Ireland, United Kingdom at the Old the hall we get to see here Paul Highland Jr. 19 and 1 that one loss came to Lewis Ritson in well in devastating fashion really he takes on Miroslav Serban who has a record of 10 and 1 that's a 10 rounder there and also on that undercard we get to see former world title challenger he got knocked out obviously by Tevin Farmer James Tennyson 22 and 3 he's in a 10 rounder against 10 and 0 undefeated Gary Neal uh, that should be interesting also on the bill we've got Tommy McCarthy I think he's still campaigning at, at um, was it Cruiserweight I think he fights at 12 and 1 he takes on Jiri Svasina journeyman 33 losses just 13 wins that's an 8 rounder there um, now moving out to the Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California, USA. I'm guessing this one's going to be on um, on ITV4. I'd have to check that one, but I think it is going to be because it's another PBC card. Um, we will see here Mario Barrios, friend of the show, a good prospect, 22 and 0. He's in a 10 rounder against Richard Zamora, the Mexican, 19 and 2. Um, we also get to see Sharif Bogir. 32-1, and one, a prospect still, by the way. Um, 10 rounds of boxing against Javier Fortuna, 33-2 and two with one draw. That is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant fight, by the way. Believe me, that is going to be a good fight. Hope that they show that one on, on, on the TV over here. Um, moving up the bill once again, Erickson Lubin, 19-1. and one. That one loss, of course, came to, um, was it Jamel or Jamal Charlo? One of the Charlos. He's in a 10-rounder against Ishe Smith, former world champion, friend of the show. 
29 and 10. Obviously, Ishe Smith has never been stopped. Um, so that's going to be an interesting test there for Lubin, who's still a young guy. I think he's only 23 or 22 or 24. Still a young guy. Still has a real bright future. Real interesting fight, that one. And topping the bill, Javonte Davis, 20 and 0. He takes on Hugo Ruiz, 39 and 4. This one's for Javonte's WBA Super World Super Featherweight title. Javonte Davis, a man that we've been trying to get back on the show ever since he came on originally, um, you know, a few years ago now. Um, yeah. That was that was a interview I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, yeah, that's a twelve round contest. The the mad thing about it is everyone was breaking this news, saying, "Well, Abner Mahrez has pulled out of the fight, and in steps Hugo Ruiz." Before it was official, it was still a rumor at the time, and I was saying, "No way, that can't be true." Hugo Ruiz, he only fought like eleven days ago on the Pacquiao undercard, and I was right. And I thought, "No, surely this is unsafe. They can't do that." I mean, I was actually saying, "No, these people that are breaking the news, they've got it wrong. That's impossible." Well, it's actually going ahead, and I think it's pretty dangerous. Hugo Ruiz is now having to move up here to Super Feather from Featherweight. Um, I think it's a bit silly. I mean, he, he can he can punch, but that's about it. And I don't even know if he can punch for a Super Featherweight, so I'm expecting Javante Davis to make light work of him. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. We've not even gone to the predictions on this fight. We've, we're actually doing no predictions on this weekend's night of fights. There's nothing really worth um you know, putting a prediction on, unfortunately. And moving over to the final couple of bills now. This one happens at the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. Um, what do we have over here? We have Joseph Diaz, 27-1. and one. He's in a 10-rounder against Charles Huerta, who has a record of 20-5. and five. That's a 10-rounder there. Uh, Diaz, obviously, former world title challenger times two, I believe. Um, or was the second attempt... When he came overweight, I think that could have been the case. Anyway, also on the bill for the WBA World Super Featherweight title, Alberto Mercado, 21 and 0. He defends his belt against Andrew Cancio, 19 and 4 with two draws. And topping the bill, Ray Vargas, the WBC World Super Bantamweight champion, 32 and 0. He's in a 12 rounder against Franklin Manzanilla, who has a record of 18 and 4. Um, like I say, a 12 rounder there. And moving out to the final bill to mention, this one, I believe, happens, I think it could be Sunday. Um, I'm not too sure, but I'm guessing it's probably going to be on Box Nation. Again, I should really be um, checking this before saying it, so please forgive me on that one. But it's happening at the Save Mart Arena in Fresno, California, USA. It's a top-ranked show. Um, it's going to be on ESPN in the States. What do we have on this bill here? We've got Joel Diaz Jr., 24-1. and one. That one loss came to Regis Progre. He's in an eight-rounder against Christian Rafael Correa, who's 28-7 and seven with two draws. Still a good prospect, Joel Diaz, even though he got dropped about four times in two rounds look at Regis Progre now you know he's he's gone to the top of the world also on this bill we've got Saul Neno Rodriguez a man that really needs to get back active he was caught in a real bad promotional contract with Mayweather Promotions 22-0 and with one draw he's in a 10-rounder against Aelio Mesquita who has a record of 17-3 and um, Andy Vences 21-0 and with one draw he's in a 10-rounder against Dardan Zenunaj 14 and 5, former opponent of Tevin Farmer before he picked up a world title. Genesis Savania, 32 and 1. He gave a good account of himself, a real tough fight to Oscar Valdez. That's where his one loss came from. He's in a 10 rounder against Carlos Castro, 21 and 0. I don't know too much about Castro, but that should be a good fight. Also, Raimundo Beltran, his first fight back since losing his world title um, to Pedraza. I think it's his first fight back. 35 and 8 with one draw. I think he's still unbelievable still in a search for a visa or not a visa I think it's a um, a green card um, he is in a 10 round contest against Hiroki Okada 19 and 0 and the final fight to mention for the WBC world super lightweight title the man that didn't get into the world boxing super series and perhaps he's laughing now if the whole thing does fall apart Jose Carlos Ramirez 23 and 0 he takes on Jose Zapida 30 and 1 that one loss came to Terry Flanagan a real bizarre 
ending to that fight where he seemed to dislocate his shoulder and he couldn't continue and then the fight ended and um, you know Terry Flanagan got the, the victory that one was for the vacant WBO world title back then so that's his one loss and it was very questionable since then I think Zapita's gone back to um, to Mexico had a couple of fights and here he is against Jose Carlos Ramirez so you'd have to favour Ramirez he's in some good form um, that's about it though we've tried to fly through that as quick as possible we've brought you the review part of the show we brought you the first guest we brought you the news part I did a great job there we've just brought you the preview part and just before we wrap up the show the last thing to do is to welcome our second and final guest ladies and gentlemen please welcome the former WBC lightweight world champion it is of course Mr. Omar Figueroa Omar welcome back on the show my friend Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure having you on. So, Omar, we last spoke back in February of last year. Um, It was right before you were supposed to take on Adrian Broner. I guess that would be a fight that... um you know, will always kind of sit with those those big fights that never did happen. Um, you haven't fought in the meantime. He has. He lost recently to Manny Pacquiao. Did you happen to watch that fight at all, Omar? No. <laughs> How peed off were you, Omar, that, that, you know, it wasn't you to inflict that loss on Broner's record there that Pacquiao inflicted? I mean, I, <laughs> I, there's really not much to say. I don't like to think back to those times because it's it's frustrating. You know, and that's that's one thing. It's driving me mad. It's driving me up the wall that I haven't been able and healthy to fight. And even though I've, I'm feeling great, I, I've made, you know, a lot of important changes to my lifestyle and my livelihood in general that, you know, I'm feeling better than ever. My mental state is better than ever. My physical state is better than ever. But, you know, we put our bodies through so much when when it comes to training camp and it's just, you know, it, it's not surprising that things happen, but it is disappointing. And you've been out the ring, like I say, um, since July 2017, that win over Robert Guerrero that we spoke about on on uh, on the show when you last came on. Now, bizarrely, Robert Guerrero retired, then unretired, and had a fight on the Wilder Fury undercard in the time that you've been absent. So tell me, Omar, you, you mentioned there it's a bit frustrating for you. What has kept you out the ring for this long? It's... You know, I'm trying to get my my body right, and you know, I've been I've been fighting for over 23 years now. So, you know, a lot has a lot has gone, a lot has happened to my body in that time. Uh, I had a, an accident when I when I initially took that time off in back into after 2015. Uh, I had a lot of family issues going on, and one thing that I stressed a lot is, you know, being mentally ready for fights. And, you know, if, if, if my core, which my core, I feel is me, my kids, my family, you know, my parents and stuff, if my core isn't right, then my mind isn't right. And my, my body isn't right. And so I don't feel like anyone should fight in that kind of state of mind uh, because, it's, you know, we don't play boxing. Boxing is a dangerous sport. And if you're not a hundred percent, at least mentally, then, a lot of things can go wrong and you know it's life and death in there it's not it's not something to be taken lightly you know you see uh Pritchard uh still struggling to get back you you saw uh Donis uh Stevenson recently go through something like that and and so it's not something to be taken lightly and I I don't care if people say that I'm that I'm scared that I'm this that I'm that you know I'm, I got to make sure that I'm right physically and especially mentally first before I step in the ring especially at the the level of fighters that I'm facing now. And uh, it's been frustrating. I mean, there's nothing I get. First off, I get paid to fight. So if I don't get paid, if I don't fight, I don't get paid. So I'm obviously not fighting on purpose. You know, I, I, I want to get paid. I need to get paid. You know, I have, I have kids, I have family, I have bills to pay. And it's, it's frustrating when I'm not able to get in the ring and fight and provide for my, for my, like I said, for my core, my family. And so, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to, to get things right outside the ring uh, so nothing goes wrong in the ring. And uh, right now, everything everything seems to be good. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, and uh, thank you for the, for, the, for the answer there. Like I say, a lot of the people that listen sometimes are not quite sure of the ins and outs of what happens outside of the ring uh, with, with a pro fighter. Now, you do finally have a date, Omar. You're set to take on John Molina Jr. on February 16th in L.A. Not long to go now. I've asked you in the past about your other opponents, and you've told me that you really don't watch much boxing at all. Have you seen much of John Molina Jr. before? No. <laughs> 
What are you expecting from him, Omar? I mean, he always he always shows up with a ton of heart. Um, he's a big puncher. I remember when he fought Lucas Matisse, it was one of the best fights I've seen in a long, long time. Yeah, I actually fought on the undercard uh, as well. I fought on that card too. Um, I didn't get to watch the fight. I think I was in the dressing room or something. I don't know what's going on, but I was I fought on that card too, and I heard it was a great fight. My I think uh, my coach Joel Diaz was training Matisse at the time. At the time, I don't remember. So I'm letting you know my coach handle the ins and outs of the strategy and all that. I'm just focused on making sure that the weight is good and that uh, I'm in shape. And talking of the weight, this is a welterweight, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's a 140. Nice, at 140. Okay, okay. Um, is that where your future is at? You see, Umar, do you see yourself being at 140 for the foreseeable future? At least for the for this fight. <laughs> I mean, I don't I don't know what uh what the future holds, but I'm gonna try and stay at 140 as long as possible. Hopefully maybe win a title there, and then um, it, when the time is right, jump up to 147 and take part in in the fiasco that that is the World Trade Division. <laughs> it truly is a fiasco. But, yeah, 140 is a hot division at the moment. Obviously, uh, you know, the World Boxing Super Series taking place. It's, it's kind of coming to an end now, um, if I'm not mistaken. But a good tournament that is, and, of course, there'll be... Uh, There'll be a you know one one rightful winner at the end of that, and you'll be right right up there to take him on. Um, how many times, Omar, are you looking at you know looking at fighting in 2019, and what goals do you have for this year, um, and what's left what's left of it? I know it's just started. Yeah, well, I we plan to get in the ring three times this year. Okay. And um, one of my main objectives is to you know first off provide for my kids. And, and my family, make sure that we're all right mentally, that we're all good and a good point. And uh, after that, you know, like I said, boxing is not my, my priority. Well, right now it is because I have a fight, right? But uh, outside of, of that, it's, you know, I got I to gotta make sure that I'm okay, uh, you know, because I have kids and I have to set a good example and I have family and I got to make sure that they're okay too. And, uh, you know, but it's it's my job and right now it's, it takes it takes everything from me to make sure that I'm okay for the fight. Um, but my goal for 2019 is to continue being happy, being satisfied with myself, being at peace, and to continue working hard. And I want to talk about your brother, Brandon. I mean, he's been extremely impressive lately. His win over Oscar Escandon back in October, and most recently in what I actually thought would be a real hard fight, he absolutely destroyed Moises Flores in three rounds. Proud brother moments for you, I'm sure. Yeah, but you can't let him know that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's something that my father always taught me, even though I was the best at it or pretty much the best at everything I did, whether it was baseball, basketball, swimming, school, you know, it was never good enough. Uh, but I tell my brother he does a good job. You know, that's one thing that my dad never told me. And I tell him that I'm proud of him, but that he could always be better and that he always, he should always strive to be better. And uh, I tell him I'm still not satisfied with the way he looks in the ring. I know he looked great against uh, Flores, but he still has a lot of work to do if he wants to compete against some of the guys that are in his division, especially you know, even here with Coach Diaz, uh, Diaz has a Kaká, whom is is from Uzbekistan or somewhere over there, and he has Diego de la Hoya too, and and those guys are tough. So my brother needs to step it up if he wants to compete with those guys. <laughs> tough love, but um, yeah, no, I mean that performance from him there. I mean, I was so shocked at his tactics to just go straight at Flores, but it really worked, and it was a, a big statement in my eyes. Um, any news on him for when he's next fighting again? I'm guessing, uh, you know, he won't be on the undercard, of course, but any news for him in the in the near future? No, as far as I know, um, he's, I mean, he's back in the gym, he's getting ready, but I don't know when or if he has a date already. Okay, no problem. And finally, Omar, the last real question, have you got anything that you want to tell our listeners or anyone in particular just before we let you go? That's about it. No, I mean, uh, just, always you know to my fans and to the supporters and to guys that are you know listening to me or, or seeing me for the first time is just you know thank you for support um i know it's been it's been rough the last couple of years the last few years actually um but i mean i'm just trying i'm trying my best and and i mean obviously like i said you know we get we get paid to fight so it's not like i'm doing it not like i'm not fighting on purpose you know, this is my livelihood. This is how I feed my kids and my family and everything. And 
and uh, I'm just trying to be the best that I can be in the ring. Um, and hopefully everything everything lines up and I'm able to, to perform and be close to my best. And, and finally, hopefully we'll see what, what I can truly do in the ring. Okay, listen, Omar, I really appreciate you giving me some of your time this week. I cannot wait to see you back in a ring. I will be looking forward to that for sure. Best of luck for February 16th, and we'll catch up sometime after. Yes, sir. Thank you. You have a great day. Okay, and this wraps up episode 173 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I had summer has been I had summer. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the new WBA Continental Champion, Mr. Craig Spider Richards, and the undefeated former WBC Lightweight World Champion, Omar Figueroa. We haven't mentioned the Prediction League at all this show, and that is because no one gained the point at all. I picked Kovalev to win by knockout and Cheeseman to win on points. The listeners picked Alvarez to win by KO and Cheeseman to win by KO. And Ayaz went with uh, Garcia to win by knockout. Almost could have happened, to be honest. And um, Alvarez by knockout. So we're all big losers this week. And the scores stay the same. There's no more news to mention. But I do just want to give a real honorable mention to the reigning WBC super lightweight world champion. We mentioned Jose Carlos Ramirez um, just before the Omar Figueroa interview. Obviously, Ramirez will be fighting this weekend against Zapida, but the reason I want to give him a special mention is because this week he's actually visiting a place called the Community Cancer Institute in California. Um, He'll be meeting with the patients and the staff so that he can actually hold an auction for his fight-worn gloves and various other fight night attire, and he'll be donating the entirety of the money raised to the Institute, and he's also given away 1,000 tickets to the patients of the Institute and their families. What a beautiful, beautiful gesture. Um, You just cannot help but respect a man that does something like that. What a true hero um, what, what a fantastic thing to do but that is about it from myself and I as please if you do get a chance please leave us a review on iTunes you do not understand how much we appreciate that we'll be back next week with another big show as per usual until then take care <laughs>